Drugs is one of those issues where all the um, all the decisions are taken by people who know very little about them. Um, this is um, not new in politics, but it's um, uh, it can sometimes uh, create a lot of problems in the more technical dossiers. It's a bit like nuclear energy. You, know, you can't live without it, and you don't really want to live with it, and drugs is a very similar thing. Um, the European Commission and the European Union institutions have been uh, looking at drugs and dealing with drug policy for quite a long time. It goes back much longer than people think. It's back to the 1990s. Uh, there was a drugs unit in the Commission then. Um, the European Monitoring Centre for Drug and Drug Addiction was set up uh, at that time because um, the European Commission and the EU in general realised that Precisely, it was a subject that we didn't know enough about, and we needed to do monitoring, uh, get some good data, um, and so on. Um, new psychoactive substances have been a problem also for quite a long time. The, uh, there's nothing new about it. Um, there is an EU instrument that deals with that, which is the Council decision on the it's got a very long name, the risk assessment. Um, and um, control, etc., of new psychoactive substance, substances. Um, Council decision 2005 387 uh, JHA, Justice and Home Affairs. So all this goes back to the beginning of the third pillar, which is now a forgotten term, but the third pillar, which is the Justice and Home Affairs pillar of Amsterdam, the Amsterdam Treaty, pre Lisbon. Um, when the um, EU began to deal with um, um, with crime, with police matters, with ju judicial matters. So we have this council decision at the moment, and in 2010 it was up for um, a reassessment. Um, and so the Commission did the reassessment and came up with a number of conclusions. Um, what, um, was, what was wrong with it, what it wasn't doing as well as we were hoping. Um, one problem with the council decision is that it has a one-by-one one approach. In other words, uh, you can only, um, you know, the commission or member states can say, well, here is, for instance, mephedrone. Let's assess mephedrone and see if we um, place it under control. Now, that takes one year, which clearly is a heavy system, only one substance at the time, and it takes too long. It's a reactive, um, it's a reactive instrument, uh, new psychoactive substances, um, you, know, you can start the assessment, and then halfway through, you find that the substance changes because they change one component of it, and you have to start it over again. So that doesn't really help. Um, so you either it's a it's an on and off instrument. You start the procedure, uh, and then you go all the way, or you don't start and you do nothing. So here again, um, it's not very flexible. Um, the last thing we found that after Lisbon. We needed to change the legal basis, which um, was a bit uh, difficult, and I believe the European Parliament is now um, challenging uh, one of the uh, um, findings uh, of the, the Council um, uh, on 4MA, I believe, one of the substances, because the, the, council, uh, the Parliament quite rightly says that um, you know, the Commission should uh, clean up the legal basis of this uh, instrument. So the Commission is now working on a successor instruments, a new proposal. Um, how is it doing this? Um, it's not thinking this up on its own. It's uh, meeting with experts on the new psychoactive substances, user organizations, policy makers, stakeholders, um, the um, uh, European Forum on Drugs is in, in town at the moment. Um, and the Commission is looking at a number of key issues. One of them is how to Im improve the actual risk assessment phase of this because it, um, uh, to, to make it both more flexible and lighter. Um, important, it's important to maintain the evidence base um, of this approach because um, one of the risks, well, one of the risk, political risks of uh, controlling new psychoactive substances is that you may do it simply because it's politically um, expedient or that there is a lot of pressure in the media to do it, but that is not a good reason. Um, another thing the new instrument will be looking at um, is um, how, to, um, uh, how to adapt um, EU decision-making on this to the diversity that exists between member states on uh, particular 
uh, substances and the way they, the law deals with them. Um, we also need to look at which substances need to be dealt with at EU level. We're dealing with things at the EU level is whatever, however you do it, it's quite expensive, it takes a long time. Um, so if you have um, one substance which is only a problem in one country, um, it's probably not worth doing it, dealing with it at a European level. Um, we also need to be able to speed up the process when a substance turns out where it's thought to be particularly risky. Um, and on the other hand, we have to avoid criminalization of users. Um, some users of these substances are using them and don't even know that they are illegal. So that, that is uh, another thing um, that needs to be looked at. Um, so we, what we're trying to do is find um, a middle ground also between doing, uh, as I said, between the, the on or off system that we have at the moment, between doing nothing or going uh, outright for criminal control, criminal law control justice. Um, finally, an important point um, is to avoid um, restrictions on some sub substances which are perfectly legitimate, and which are used in the industry, um, I don't know, the paint industry or something, uh, but which packaged in another way are sold as legal highs or uh, new psychoactive substances. Um, so if you start banning them with um, uh, criminal law orders, uh, you're creating a lot of problems for uh, industry, the market, and so on, the legitimate market. Um, the it, yeah, so the proposal that's going through the system at the moment is also uh, looks at the ways of building in gradations of intervention. You don't always need the heavy... Uh, the heavy hand of the state or of Europe um, to just ban one little uh, substance, depending on whether it's risky or not. Uh, it is looking at um, health protection, if you like, consumer protection, um, because people will consume these things, and as I said, some of them are legal. Um, and uh, I mean, if I want to, you know, uh, if I want to make uh, pills out of um, some paint I have in my house. Uh, to paint the wall, uh, nobody can stop me, but I do need some consumer protection. Um, so what about the purely criminal aspects, very quickly? Um, there, are, there is a school of thought that says whoever is selling this stuff is basically um, you know, a criminal. Um, I, I don't really believe that. I think, uh, particularly in Western Europe, a lot of sellers are just um, people who are trying to, you know, to as they say, explore the boundaries of legality. Okay, uh, we, we all do that at some stage, and <laughs> almost every day, uh, if you're driving a car or something. But, um, uh, so, yeah, we're not necessarily dealing with organised crime here. There is organised crime. We know that. Um, I believe that their involvement for the moment is still relatively limited. Um, we know that some of this stuff is being made in China. It, it, you know, there is organised crime is mainly involved in in the sort of repackaging, reselling, and, and, and the, 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 the logistics of it. But a lot of the problems are local for the moment. Um, I mean, we know we, we've, we've, we've identified, I believe, about 250 substances, something like that. And as far as I know, about 15 are a bit of a problem, are selling well, a bit of a real problem in some countries, uh, because they're being used not as... Um, not as something, um, um, as a rec recreational drug, but they have, I believe in Romania and some countries, yeah. they are uh, being used as you know, injecting drugs, they are replacing other drugs, and that obviously is a completely separate issue. Um, very important, um, Europe has, um, the EU has, I think always since the, the 1990s, um, had um, the the balanced approach and the evidence base as its two cornerstones of policy. Um, without that, we're lost. I think if we if let go of that, you get um, what I would call um, American situations. And uh, I, I think that it's very important to, um, that we stick with that. Um, and as I've already said, it's important not to be spooked by the media or by, by um, you know, say, your presence, by politicians, um, who, um, um, or by commissioners, who can, you know, um, 
get votes or get attention by uh, being tough on drugs and uh, you know we've got to ban this we've got to ban that um, because it doesn't we know it doesn't work uh, it's been tried and it doesn't work um, the interesting thing is that um, in uh, as far as I know there is no there's no correlation between um, between uh, let's say uh, strict anti um, uh, new uh, new psychoactive substances legislation and and use or rather the the correlation is of often uh, inverted you know the stricter the legislation the more people will go and look for these substances um, it's not always true but it's true in quite a number of cases and it's something to remember as well um, I think I'll leave it there. Um, I think there are plenty of people around the table who know more about this than I do, so um, I'd be um, very happy to uh, ask a question, but I'd be even happier to listen to some of the real experts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gerardo.